folks, it's me, Mr. Lang, and here today I am going to talk about ecosystems. And if you look in this beautiful picture, we've got a lovely ecosystem going on. We've got some coral reef going on back here with the fish that are going to be eating small organisms that grow on the coral reef. And we have the turtle that'll eat some of the fish and just an amazing array of different relationships that exist between biotic and abiotic factors. We've got the water and the salts and the minerals in the water and the sunlight and all of those things that do all of the things that drive life on the reef. But that's not the only place that life is being driven. Life is being driven right around us in temperate deciduous forests like the one that we looked at in class either yesterday or a couple of days from now depending on when you're seeing this. Um, and it's really important to talk about this because this is all about energy and as you know the vast majority of energy for life on earth originates with the sun and the sun hits photosynthesizers which we've just spent a lot of time learning about uh, and it allows those photosynthesizers to fix carbon into glucose so that something like this little herbivore can eat it. Now look, check this out. We've got an arrow running from the grass to the little herbivore, to our little grasshopper here, and that means that energy is being transferred in that direction. And then that grasshopper might be eaten by a mouse, and that mouse, look at that, he's got an arrow going to him too. That means that the energy from the grasshopper is going to the mouse, and from the mouse to the snake, and from the snake to the hawk. Now here's the deal. Each of these levels is called a trophic level. We're going to talk more about those in a minute, but it's a, an important term to start rolling around in your head because, uh, because we're going to use it. And we have lots of trophic levels. The one There's one thing about this diagram that I don't love. Um, this sort of implies that only the hawk can die and then be digested by decomposers like um, fungus and bacteria and things like that, when in fact all of these things could be decomposed by something uh, and those nutrients can be recycled. We've got some biological cycles that go on to get those nutrients back to our producers. Everything gets broken down and um, heads back to our producers so we can increase primary productivity in whatever area we're at. So, um, so that's a, a really sort of simple food chain. There's another example uh, that gets a little more complicated. I'm going to show you the next slide. It's a food web, and this is the Chesapeake Bay Waterbird food web. Uh, and you can look and you can see we've got all of these different birds, and these birds eat these birds and fish, and these fish and birds eat some mussels and some other fish, and all of the energy originates down at the bottom with the primary producers, again, as usual. So we've got our primary producers, which are in this case, again, going to be photosynthetic, and they're going to feed the entire food web. I want you to look at this food web for just a minute, and I want you to figure out what's wrong with it. Go ahead and pause the video now. Look it over and tell me what's wrong with it. What's wrong with it? And we're back. So you looked at it. Maybe it took you a minute, but hopefully you ended up somewhere down over by zooplankton. And when you looked at zooplankton, you thought to yourself, well, that's an herbivore, which means it doesn't make food for itself. It's not a producer, but it also doesn't have an energy source. So um, we could fix that by simply adding an arrow between the phytoplankton and the zooplankton, and we'd we would then have fixed this. But, but the energy's got to come from somewhere. It doesn't just come out of thin air, unless you're a photosynthesizer. And then it kind of does. We talked about that. Anyways, so, um, so, so that's a, a food web. You take one part of this food web away, and you can sort of um, unbalance the entire thing. And when things go out of balance, that whole ecosystem will be affected. And that's not a fantastic thing for things that are up the food chain. So... Uh, it's really important to, to keep that sort of balance in mind. And with that, I want to move on to what we call the energy pyramid. And this is a really commonly used uh, idea where we've got our producers down at the bottom. Those are, in this case, the photosynthesizers. We know that there are some other organisms on Earth that don't photosynthesize, and our producers, we'll talk about them later on. Uh, but the vast majority of things that we think about as producers are indeed photosynthesizers. So they are our grasses and our algaes and our cyanobacteria and all of those sorts of things that drive 
uh, energy production and primary productivity for every environment. They're the things that are fixing carbon into glucose um, through the process of photosynthesis, which you are all intimately familiar with now and know in more detail than you ever thought you would or ever thought you needed to. Um, so all of those primary producers provide energy for our primary consumers. In this case, our primary consumers are going to be these little bunnies and they are herbivores. That means that they only eat primary producers. And then we move up a level to the secondary consumers. Well, secondary consumers are going to be our minor carnivores, things like snakes, um, that sort of thing, some omnivores even. And then we move to the top level consumers in any environment. And those top level consumers in any environment um, are things like a wolf in Yellowstone, for example, um, or something like a hawk in um, a field ecosystem or a shark in the ocean and that sort of thing. Um, those are those are really important organisms. And those organisms, um, there are some there are some theories around ecosystem ecology that say, and it's proven out every single time it's happened, um, that anytime you remove one of these species, they will be replaced by something else because otherwise the species, the, the ecosystem is just going to go out of whack. And sometimes those are also called keystone species like we talked about before, but something else down the line could also be a keystone species if its removal would cause the collapse of the ecosystem. It's just something that's really a really important species in the area. So, um, so important to think that we get energy going from here to here to here to here. And the reason why it's a pyramid is because we've got, um, we've got fewer and fewer organism, organisms at each level, which might make you ask why. Well, why do we have fewer organisms at each level? It's because, if you look at our little guy here, I think that's a uh, tomato hornworm, maybe tobacco hornworm, I'm not sure. But, uh, but this little guy here, you can see that of of all the, the food that he's going to eat, all the energy that he or she is going to take in, a whole lot of it is going to be used to go out in different ways. And there's not, so a whole lot is going to go out in wastes. And a whole lot of it is going to go out through cellular respiration. And a whole lot of it is going to go out through growth and adding on biomass. Um, and very little of it is actually going to be passed along to the bird that picks it up off the plant and eats it. Um, so with that in mind, let's take a look at the energy pyramid with a slightly different eye and realize that there's this thing called the rule of 10. And it doesn't hold 100% completely true, but it's cl the, the transfer of energy is close enough. So um, for example, if I've got 1,000 kilocalories, which is just a big C calorie. That's the kind of calories that are reported on the back of the foods that you eat. So if you've got 1,000 calories, we'll call it, um, of energy that has been produced by the primary producer. So this is the level of primary production in this ecosystem um, over a certain period of time is 1,000 kilocalories. That means that only 10% of that's going to be available up the line to the primary consumers. So those primary consumers will only have 100 calories available to them. And the secondary consumers will only have 10, and the tertiary consumers will only have one calorie of that original 1,000 calories that had been produced by these producers. What that means is, at every step, there's a little bit less energy available for consumption. It stands to reason, then, that we're going to have a lot more biomass at the bottom of this pyramid than the top. In fact, this pyramid is completely skewed because if we say 1,000, 100, 10, and 1, it's not biomass wise, if I took these organisms and I dried them out and then um, I weighed their dry mass, it's not going to look like an even pyramid. It's going to look something more like this, where we've got a huge biomass difference between the, the bottom level and the next level up and the primary consumers and the secondary consumers and the secondary consumers and the tertiary consumers. So this is probably a better look at what that energy pyramid really looks like if you're thinking about it as far as biomass is concerned, which is just that dry mass. Um, so I want to jump back to an idea that I just talked about a second ago, and that idea was the idea of primary productivity. So primary productivity is just how much energy is being produced uh, in grams 
per meter square per year. So, so how many grams of glucose is this particular ecosystem capable of producing per meter squared per year? And if you look at the different areas, we have desert and scrub and then tundra. So those two are, are I mean, I know they're very different, but they're, but they're pretty similar primary productivity wise. And if you think about it, they're both really barren landscapes, which kind of makes sense. Um, and if you think about something like a tropical rainforest, well, you've got lots and lots of biomass from the primary producer and the primary productivity level all the way up through um, your tertiary consumers. So it makes sense that if you have more primary productivity, you're going to have a greater ability to support life right on up through all the trophic levels. Um, and the less primary productivity you have, the less you're going to be able to support as far as the other trophic levels are concerned. So that's an important idea to be thinking about. But that primary productivity thing really is just grams of glucose produced per meter squared per year. And that's what that's what this is getting at. So grams of glucose per meter squared per year um, produced by the primary producers in that area. So that's the energy piece. Then when it comes to ecosystems, there's a whole nother side and that other side is matter. So we had energy and now we have matter. And what does that matter? It matters a lot because if we don't have cycling of matter, we run out of matter. So you've heard about the water cycle and the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle. You might not have heard of the phosphorus cycle or the oxygen cycle or the sulfur cycle. I know you've heard of the rock cycle. Um, that's just a geochemical cycle. But um, I've added examples, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but I think it's really important that you be able to explain why nutrient cycling is important. And if, if we wanted to, we could just kind of blip back up to, um, to this, right? As we, go through, as we go through our entire food web or food chain in this case, we end up with everything getting decomposed eventually so that its nutrients can be reused. If that didn't happen, those nutrients wouldn't be available to the primary producers in that ecosystem and wouldn't be able to drive more. So if, we, if I blip back down through, sorry if I'm making you dizzy with all of these slides here, um, we can look at something like the water cycle where we have evaporation and transpiration from trees and then all of that all of that water evaporating up condenses and then precipitates down and then runs back down. That's the way we don't run out of water and the way we purify water. Um, that's the water cycle. Really important to think about the carbon cycle, which you may think carbon cycle, I don't know what that is, but you really actually do because it's all about what we're talking about with photosynthesis. So, um, so there's carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, in the air, and with water and sun, trees can photosynthesize and they fix that carbon into glucose so that that carbon thing can then be eaten by animals, used by plants, those things die, they break down, carbon is released into the atmosphere, also released into the atmosphere through factories and cars and all that kind of stuff, and then it gets fixed again by trees and over and over again, we have the carbon cycle. Same sorts of ideas happen through all of these cycles. I'm going to make this PowerPoint available to you. You can also just pause on each of these and look at them. The rock cycle probably is maybe the least important. I thought I'd add that in because you talked about it a lot in uh, ESS probably. But the sulfur cycle, oxygen cycle, the phosphorus cycle, nitrogen cycle, and then we already went through the carbon cycle. So all of those things are really, really important. Um, and I think that without any of them, we're going to end up having our entire ecosystem fall out of whack and things aren't going to work the way that they're supposed to work. Um, and any disturbances like that can cause an overall collapse of an ecosystem. So um, that's all I have to say about ecosystems. I hope this was helpful. Take care. Have a good day.